So let's go ahead and get started. I do have a quick poll here that we'd like to launch uh, for our attendees. So if you could take a moment here and, and complete the poll. There may be, to submit the poll, you might have to actually hit submit. It doesn't look like any of the answers have come through yet. Give you guys about 20 more seconds here and then we can, can move ahead and get started. All right, uh, Joel, Michelle, Bob, I think you guys can see the, see the results of the polling questions. Uh, for those that are in attendance today, it looks like we have about two thirds board members, uh, about a quarter, quarter managers and, and the rest of the attendees are homeowners and business partners. Uh, as far as uh, unwelcome surprises, uh, sounds like about 60% of those in attendance have uh, experience with um, you know, surprises with, with building infrastructure and having issues in the last three years. Uh, most of which have funded those through reserves, about 35%. And as far as purchasing your unit and disclosing potential uh, project costs, it looks like about 49% of you have said that that wouldn't change your purchase decision. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started and I'm gonna turn, turn things over to Joel. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, I'm calling from the West Coast right now. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, as Matt indicated, I'm the Managing Director of uh, Community Association Products and Risk Management at McGowan Program Administrators. Uh, I've been involved in this section of community association industry for the past 20 years. Prior to that, I was an attorney in California for... 15 years, I'm a uh, community insurance and risk management specialist. I'm a fellow of the College of Community Association Lawyers, uh, the father of four and the grandfather of four. Um, I'm, if you're interested in reading more, uh, feel free to do so, but I'd like to just move on because we have a lot to cover. So next. Okay. The FCAR think tank force on aging infrastructures, breaking point, examining aging infrastructures and community associations. We, this is about three years ago now when we sat down and this was our second task force and project for the think tank. And as you can see, 70% of the people in the survey, and we had surveyed, I think it was about five or 600 people in the industry, similar to the breakdown of people uh, that are attending today. Um, and most everybody at that time said, you know, the uh, property values were their key main concern uh, next. And 80% over a three year period, similar to the 60%, I guess, I think you indicated here, had some form of unanticipated and unplanned infrastructure problem. The key that we're looking at here that I think has piqued a lot of people's interest and I think unfortunately may have a certain amount of a silver lining is uh, then came uh, the Champlain Towers uh, condominium collapse in Miami, uh, Southern Florida, which I think everybody there uh, is quite familiar with. Um, next. 
This is a key question. And I think Michelle probably can relate to this one as somebody who's involved with reserve, the reserve study world. Where can any of you see the infrastructure problems in these three pictures? I mean, I look at these three pictures and they all look like places that I'd probably want to move in or buy. Um, but the key is how will your association identify or let alone pay for problems when they just aren't manifest, you just don't see them. Um, we had a, an issue with in Champlain where Florida has the 40 year certification issue. They actually did the report. They didn't follow the report and we know the results. Next. So this is what we was really a, a significant issue prior to the Champlain issue. Uh, this was a matter, and fortunately, I had the opportunity of having the director's officer's liability claim on this. Harbor Towers in Boston, one of the most beautiful areas and the most beautiful views, as you can see to the pictures on the left. Seven, uh, 1970, it was built 600 units, 40 stories, two towers. They didn't do anything other than cosmetic upgrades during that period, that uh, 37 year period. They just did whatever made it look good. 2007, they had a major discovery of significant problems. Um, there were no upgrades, no repairs, nothing done significant with the HEAC system. In a building, 40 towers, you have that, you have elevators, you have other systems. That ended up costing, as you can see here, $75.6 million um, special assessment. And no matter how well their reserve was funded, I can guarantee you that was not, would not have been enough to cover the 75 million. And most people with the surprises haven't had this significant of a surprise. Uh, the Champlain, as you probably are aware, had about a $15 million special assessment. This uh, building, $75,000 to $400,000 assessments per unit. The reality is some people had to sell their units because they couldn't afford to pay the special assessments. And as with many things, it's always the directors and officers' fault, so they get sued. And we'll get to that in a, a few minutes. I think Bob will probably get to that as well. Next. Then came the Champlain Towers condominiums. This is what they looked before the collapse. Okay, so this is about two months ago. And I think for the two years from, they, they received what was called a 40 year certification report in 2018. That report identified significant issues to the infrastructure. So from that point on, they had no excuse. And from that point on, the board really was working very difficult and very vigorously to uh, get the work done, to get a special assessment issued. When it was first done, my understanding, it was about eight or nine million dollars. Um, <clears throat> the board resigned, a new board came in and the president worked vigorously, she did. Um, to really get the, the unit owners to do this. At that time, it then became a $15 million product project. As we all know who uh, are involved in this stuff, these things never get cheaper. They only get more and more expensive. Um, and here are the people saying, well, why are you so concerned? Do you think the building will collapse? That was kind of prophetic. Um, and unfortunately, finally, they were able to get the, the group, the uh, unit owners to agreed to the special assessment. The president was able to get financing and then she got the contractor. And then what happened next? It was too little too late. Next slide. So this is what we have after the collapse. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that at minimum, the 98 lives that were lost, the building that was lost, that those will at least be a wake up call to people. We hope, God forbid, when we did start the task force, um, I can tell you that none of us on the task force 
had any inclination that we're looking at a possible collapse building. Um, Michelle, having inspected many buildings in her career, I can imagine maybe uh, saw some that she was hoping wouldn't collapse. Um, but this, I think, rings a, a bell that at this point can't be unrung. Uh, just to give you an idea, the, the building, I think, was about 130 million value. They had insurance um, of 30 million on the property. They had, uh, and what happened here is all the carriers, the general liability, the DNO, the umbrella, and the property carriers all basically just tendered their limits. And what's very interesting there is, in my opinion, there's no coverage, neither defense nor indemnity, but these carries, especially on this one, where there was so much empathy and sympathy for these people and their families that the carriers knew that they were gonna be fighting this for so long that they're just gonna put up their limits and at least get the uh, public relations benefit from this situation. But it's no longer an ignorance is bliss situation because now people are gonna to have to take this seriously. And I'm not sure whether insurance companies down the road will have the same type of uh, situation. So who's potentially liable? The association, past and present board members, management company. Um, in this case, the manager was an association employee, somebody with, I believe, 25 plus years experience. He was a PCAM, had a great designation, but, and you can look at developers, engineers, city, county. There's a lot of different potential people here that I can tell you no matter what you do, at the end of the day, the insurance is not going to be a solution. Um, fully funding a reserve study is not going to be a solution. But what's going to be the solution is when your reserve specialist identifies that you need to go to the next step. You need to do additional uh, testing. You need to bring in an expert. And at the end of the day, that's going to only is going to be the only thing that really is going to provide a solution in my humble opinion. Um, and as we said, you know, it only gets more expensive. Um, this is something that a lot of people moving into condominiums just don't understand at the beginning. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Aging infrastructure, so what? Um, they told me the fees about fees and assessments. They told me about wear and tear, which is based on the reserve studies. They told me about unexpected perils, which is covered by insurance, but no one told me about hidden infrastructure wear and tear. Um, could you imagine being one of the people in the Harbor Towers and all of a sudden you get a notice or at a tender board meeting say, and by the way, um, we have to come up with $75 million amongst the 600 of us um, to fix this stuff. Uh, that might ruin some people's day. Um, and people think, am I responsible for those costs? Can I, I can't afford them. Why weren't we prepared for this? And a lot of it has to <clears throat> really focus on the fact that these not-for-profit community associations, these condominiums are budget-driven entities. And if they don't include within the budgets, these potential hidden infrastructures, remember buildings like people get old they wear out they and stuff happens you know things change in champlain when we get the report i think you're going to ultimately find that besides the fact that there are probably some issues with the materials used you're also right on the beach with salt water you've got hurricanes and such that you know i don't even think that the 40-year certification is really the the solution i think it's going to have to start right from the beginning and again you're going to have, I mean, it, reserve studies are absolutely a must, but we really have to go to reserve studies 2.0. Next. <clears throat> so how does this hurt the property value? When you defer maintenance, that means you're giving it to the next people, possibly the purchasers to take care of this. Unchecked building conditions lead to a harbor towers, and hopefully if you have the situation, it's not gonna be a harbor tower, it'll maybe be, you know, a smaller issue. Um, and you have underfunded obligations. And I'm 
as I said, as an unbudgeted item, you have to find out where you can get the money. What you have to keep in mind is there, there are governing documents, as we all know, uh, especially the board members here, that you can only in, do a special assessment for a certain percentage. So if you can only do a special uh, assessment for 10% without the whole association's vote, you're really in a situation that creates problems that we have here in the Champlain Towers because the, the, the board wasn't the problem here. Uh, with all due respect to the, the people who lost their lives, it were the unit owners who really gave the pushback that put it to the point where it was uh, no, uh, you know, no return. Um, so at the end of the day, you really have to understand what your obstacles may be. One of the problems with, um, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, we need to do mandatory um, reserve studies. We have it in nine uh, states at this point. The problem with that is most of those states, they can waive funding. Um, so it kind of defeats half the purpose. Um, but people really have to understand that this is a, a really a certain aspect of living in a community association that you have to consider when you're doing budgets and you know you need to rely on your your experts you need to bring in your your accounts you need to bring in your reserve specialists your insurance people so they can really sit down and help you understand what needs to be done uh, next this uh, Tyler birding is uh, a gentleman who was very has sort of been an industry leader in this topic for a long time. Um, he was on our task force, led really the task force in a lot of ways. And this is what he said, which is basically what we're all saying. Even where an association implements <clears throat> periodic reserve studies, unless those studies consider possible hidden issues, they won't be adequate. And that's really what we're finding uh, when we can come at this point. And I can tell you, insurance isn't the solution. And you know, we do have to pay close attention, but in this situation, similar to the situation with the COVID, um, when people found out that there's not gonna be any coverage really for COVID, you know, people are now starting to ask questions. Uh, boards are now, as I think they should have from day one, are bringing the insurance professionals to the table to discuss it with them, as opposed to having, you know, playing the telephone game and having, you know, the management company or others, you know, bring those proposals to them. It's really something the uh, board has to do. Next. So these are the takeaways and hopefully the, these will be available to you. Um, I don't wanna focus on all of them, but budgeting, education and professionals, that's really what it's all about. Um, the reserve study, it's not, it's, critical, but it's not a substitute for the periodic in-depth infrastructure assessments. You're going to get with your study, in most cases, um, you're going to get a list of recommendations of things you might do, additional things you might want to uh, take seriously and take a look at. Um, you know, that, that's something. And, and number five, <clears throat> this is something that boards have to do. The board's duty is not to save money but it's to be diligent in protecting, preserving, and enhancing the association assets. Uh, I can tell you, Bob probably can tell you that we spent many years where people said, you know, what, we're, we did our best for the association because we haven't increased assessments for 10 years. I tell people if that's what you're seeing, then you should move to the next condo that you wanna look at because that is not, in my opinion, a good thing. Um, uh, next. And these are some of the takeaways for, for really what you need to do. You can't avoid doing maintenance when it's necessary. You gotta do it at the time. Again, it's cheaper the sooner you do it. You gotta be aware of what, what are you gonna do in the case of a surprise? At least now everybody knows the possibility of surprises. Um, it's always easier to fund little bits at a time you know, it's like your 401k where you're putting in time and now we're, you know, those of us who didn't save earlier and now we get the time to add more at this late stage, it's still, we know if you fund it from day one, that's really what is going to make this a lot more palatable. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's education. 
You know, CAI, for example, has so much education for boards, a lot of it online. Uh, next. And I'll turn it over now to uh, Matt. All right, thank you, Joel. Before we turn it over to Michelle here to touch base on reserve studies, we do have another short poll. Uh, this one is one question. So we have that launched here. When is the last time your community has had a reserve study? If you are a manager that's in attendance, uh, you could answer this. When's the last time one of your associations has had a reserve study completed? And go ahead and uh, close the poll and I'll try to reopen it here real quick. Okay, I relaunched it. Let's see if that works for the attendees. There we go. All right, 40% of attendees have had a reserve study uh, for their community within, within the last year. Uh, within the last three years, 35%. Within the last five years, 11%. More than five years ago, 8%. And those that have not had a study represent 7% of attendees today. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Michelle. Thanks, Matt. Well, first of all, it's great to hear so many of you have had recent reserve studies. That's fantastic and absolutely what we love to hear. Um, and for those 15% or so that study is uh, probably out of date or you haven't had one, kudos to you for joining today to learn about it. Uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time to, to learn about it, invest in your association, um, and, and hear about reserves and the importance of it. So as Matt mentioned, my name is Michelle and I am with Reserve Advisors. Uh, we are a national firm that prepares reserve studies. Uh, personally, I oversee the Northeast region. Um, I am a reserve specialist and a professional engineer, uh, hold CAI's Educated Business Partner designation, and serve on the uh, foundation board uh, with Bob. Um, so this is something that is near and dear to all of us, and uh, we appreciate your time for, for letting us speak to you about it. I wanted to start today with covering what is a reserve study. Uh, so a reserve study really is a budget planning tool which identifies the current status. Uh, status, current reserve status refers to the savings account in the equation below uh, of that reserve fund and a stable and equitable funding plan uh, that refers to the contributions in the equation below. Uh, to offset the anticipated future major common area expenditures, which is the, of course, expenditures in the equation below. The reserve study consists of two main parts. So first, there's a physical analysis where the reserve specialist is inspecting the community and performing a condition assessment. That's how we are determining those necessary expenditures. And then there's a financial analysis. So that's where we are preparing a cash flow analysis, um, where we are utilizing the savings or how much you have in reserves at the time the study is conducted. Um, and we're trying to offset those expenditures. So we're going to tell you the ideal contributions that are necessary to avoid a shortfall or a special assessment or a loan. So we're really looking at the needs of the community. Um, and then based on how much money you have in the bank today, telling you the ideal contributions to that reserve account to avoid surprises. I really liked Joel's um, kind of reference or example of comparing a building or community to a, a person or a body. That's an example I like to use too. Uh, a reserve study really is, if you consider it kind of your annual bill of health or check with your general practitioner, right? They know um, the body has many, many parts and they know about all of them. But if you have any special concern, if there's something that's a little off, um, maybe you're having a heart issue, they're going to give you a referral to a cardiologist, right? Or if you're having a skin issue, they're going to give you a referral to a dermatologist. So a reserve study is a great idea for your overall financial health, but you really do need to be bringing in specialists for any areas of certain concern. 
It's also important uh, to understand that a capital reserve study is not the same thing as a preventative maintenance plan. A preventative maintenance plan is a budget planning tool that is used to aid community associations in setting aside funds for anticipated common element maintenance expenditures. So these maintenance expenditures are ideally incorporated into the operating budget, right? Um, this sort of plan will include identification, quantification, and financial analysis of these regular or routine scheduled activities uh, that you really should be doing to maintain the association's common elements. A couple examples that I like to use uh, is for an HVAC system. A reserve study is going to include replacement of that, but you ideally in your budget should be accounting for the necessary maintenance to extend the useful life of that component, right? You should have semi-annual maintenance contracts for your HVAC system. You can even use the same uh, kind of analogy for let's say a wood dock. Uh, a wood dock would be included in your reserve study, right? We know you're gonna have to replace that dock, um, but you're gonna need to perform some preventative maintenance to it as well. Ideally, you're gonna go in periodically, you're going to seal those wood members, you're gonna replace isolated fasteners and maybe even a few deck boards. Not all communities have a formal maintenance plan, but it is something you really should invest in and consider to help extend the useful life of your components. Make sure that you're spending your money as well as possible to extend that life, um, really get the best bang of your buck for each individual component. So sort of the uh, kind of elephant in the room, do reserve studies ensure we can avoid what happened at Surfside? It's important to mention that we're still not entirely sure what happened at Surfside, uh, but what we do know is there was some very serious deterioration that unfortunately was due to deferred maintenance. Uh, we do know if they had conducted periodic reserve studies, they would have been aware of the necessary maintenance needed for their building, especially with them being kind of a waterfront property, right? Ideally, they would have funded reserves if they understood the needs and would have been able to proactively maintain the building. So when the time came for these projects and they were aware of them, they could have had the funds available to fund them. It's important uh, to remember that the recommendations are based on a visual non-invasive inspection of the community and really based on the reserve specialist experience. Uh, like our firm has prepared reserve studies for 26,000 communities across the country, right? So as we've worked with communities over the last 30 years, we've been able to really get our arms around the type of maintenance that these communities need. Um, using the uh, Surfside example, it's very typical for us to include building repairs, such as concrete restoration and a plaza deck replacement, two of the issues that were at Surfside. Um, we're going to document any areas of concern, right? So if we see spalling concrete or settlement or water infiltration, a reserve specialist is going to document these areas, but they're going to recommend further evaluation. You really do need to work with a specialist to fully get your arms around the extent of the problem to make sure that it's remediated properly. Here's a few pictures. Um, these are actual communities that we have worked with, right, that show pretty substantial deterioration. These are pretty significant issues and examples of when we flagged them and said, hey, this is a really big problem. We're going to include near-term expenditures to address this, but you really need to work with a specialist to make sure you get your arms around the extent of this problem to properly remediate it. And then we're going to include future preventative maintenance because a reserve study is typically 30 years. This isn't something you're going to do once, right? This is something you're going to need to keep doing to proactively maintain your building. So how do we ensure we're doing that? How should we be properly managing our property? There's kind of three main points that I'm gonna to cover today. Number one is a realistic expectation of the reserve study scope. Number two, we wanna make sure that you're not overlooking these professional consultants. And then three, we wanna make sure that you're accounting for these expenses in the budget. So number one, the reserve study scope, determining realistic expectations. Sometimes, unfortunately, boards expect the reserve study to identify all problems. A reserve study is a great budgeting and forecasting tool, but it is important to remember that it's limited to the visual assessment and inspection. 
Um, I want to use that same kind of building uh, that Joel mentioned, same similar structure. A reserve specialist is going to know that you're going to need to prepare or perform, let's say, facade repairs on this building, right? But our condition assessment is limited to the limited area that we can see, right? So we're going to observe the components that we can see, the areas that we can see, and then we're going to rely on our experience of working with similar buildings of similar construction, similar age, and it's really our experience that we're going to use to provide estimates for necessary needs of this building. But realistically, you should have, for a building of this size and scope, a specialist come out, a building envelope specialist, to evaluate the entire facade, right? We want to understand the entire condition of your building so that that's incorporated into the reserve study. That's really going to enhance it and make it much more accurate. You can use the same uh, example, say, for piping, right? Um, we know that this building and these buildings are going to have a bunch of piping and it's going to be very expensive. So we can see likely the type of piping that was used and maybe limited amounts of the piping. But for the most part, it's hidden behind the walls, right? So we are going to rely on uh, our experience of working with similar buildings of similar age of similar construction and understanding your materials and information that's provided to us to come up with estimates for pipe replacements. So things like that will be accounted for in your reserve study, but those are still estimates, right? We can't visually assess the piping. So it's a really good idea to have an independent pipe analysis where your pipes are scoped and you're determining your exact condition of your pipes so that that's incorporated into your reserve study. The more input you have from specialized experts, the more enhanced and accurate your reserve study really will be. I'd like to show a snapshot, just kind of a little snippet of a uh, reserve study expenditure plan to kind of put this into perspective, right? A reserve specialist is trained to look at hundreds and hundreds of elements, just using groups. Is it a shingle roof, a tile roof? Um, is it a foam roof, modified bitumen, EPDM, thermoplastic? I mean, there's 10 to 15 different types of roofs, right? And then we have facades. Is it masonry, concrete, EFIS, stucco, vinyl siding, fiber cement siding, wood siding, right? There's multiple different construction practices for various components. Then of course we have floor coverings and fitness equipment and uh, generators and parking garages and pools and fences, right? The amount of different types of components associations have is really endless, right? So going back to that analogy of your general doctor or general bill of health, we are going to visually assess everything and put together best recommendations based on what we can see, but it is really helpful to have any areas of special concern or things that require invasive testing. It's really, really helpful to have the reserve study supplemented with information from those specialists. Uh, reserve specialists are always happy to take that sort of information into account, review it, and incorporate it into the reserve study. This is a really helpful graph, I think, and one that I always encourage our clients to share. Uh, so this graph really is a graphical representation of a cash flow analysis, right? And really shows the importance of why reserves existed or exist. If they didn't exist, uh, the red bars in this graph are the expenditures, right? So without a reserve account, you'd have these huge fluctuations in your budget. And it makes it really difficult to manage uh, a property or even personal finances when you're having these fluctuations. The goal of a reserve study and the reserve account is to stabilize those contributions. We want relatively flat, just inflationary increases to that reserve account, right? So there are going to be years where you're contributing more than you're spending. And that's the full intention of reserves, right? You're kind of growing that reserve account. And then there's gonna be years where you're spending much, much more than you're contributing to where essentially if the reserve account didn't exist, you'd have to specially assess, right? So you're draining that reserve account, which is perfect. We don't want it to stay artificially high forever. We do want you to drain that reserve account. And then you're gonna go into years of rebuilding again. It's important not to just stop contributing to reserves, say we're through our near-term projects, we've replaced our roof, we're good. 
we don't need to contribute to the reserves anymore, or we can back down our contributions because we've made it through these near-term huddles. You need to proactively make sure that you understand the full needs of your property, right? It's not just these near-term expenditures. Now, when you can have kind of lower expenses, once you kind of got through that near-term hurdle, you want to be in those, that growth mode. It's good that you're contributing much more than you're spending, because if you look just 15 years out, you have these other really large expenses. So maybe you need to modernize elevators or replace 20 miles of streets, right? Where you're now again, draining that reserve account, which is perfect. We want those relatively stable contributions, regardless of what happens to the expenses. We know they're gonna vary over time. And we wanna help homeowners kind of stabilize their finances. Before we jump into the next slide, a question just did come in that relates to this part of the presentation. Um, so I'm gonna take a moment to answer, have you answer that. Can the reserve study make recommendations on what specialist we should be getting involved to inspect the entire facade? So maybe, uh, you know, the, not only the type of specialist, but who we should be hiring in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as a, like we will recommend which type of specialist, um, but as far as specific names, um, we can mention names of, you know, uh, people in the area that have done these similar type of projects. Uh, but realistically, what we like to do is provide multiple options. We don't endorse um, other companies per se for this sort of work when we don't directly work with them, right? So we can speak to what we've heard from our clients, but it is um, kind of more, we are that sort of outside. What we like to make sure that our clients are doing is that they are going to CAI service directories. So I send them very often when I'm asked for names, links to CAI service directories, because those are firms that are coordinated with CAI, they're used to working with community associations. And so that really gives you a good um, starting point to start contacting companies for a specialist that you feel comfortable with. Great, thanks, Michelle. Okay, number two, so don't overlook professional consultants. Uh, conditions aren't hidden, they're just not identified. And that's a really big difference, right? There's, it's a very big difference between being hidden and just being unaware of necessary maintenance. If you're unaware and these aren't remediated, conditions can go from minor to bad to catastrophic really quickly. So you should really be bringing in specialized experts more frequently. Uh, looking at the second picture here, this is a waterproof membrane, probably to a plaza deck, right? Where we know that you're gonna have to replace it every 25 to 35 years. Well, as that element ages, it's a good idea to start having an invasive inspection performed. Remove those pavers, take a look at the membrane. Is it holding up? Is it starting to deteriorate? You don't wanna wait until the membrane has completely failed, water has infiltrated through that whole membrane and is now ruining the concrete structure underneath to a point where you can see it in the garage underneath or the structural member underneath. By that point, it's, it's pretty late and gonna be pretty costly to repair. So we really recommend these proactive inspections to make sure that you're keeping your arms around the condition of your components and proactively replacing uh, the components when you need to, to um, help minimize the cost. Because the further you wait, the more deterioration that occurs and the more expensive it costs. So what are some professional consultants that are often overlooked until associations face a critical issue? Well, of course, there's the typical building consultants, right? So an architect or structural engineer, building envelope specialist, or an MEP engineer. But what about all the site components too, right? What about a pond specialist to make sure that your ponds still have adequate storage? Uh, maybe it has filled up with sediment and you don't have the storage necessary and you could cause flooding throughout your community. You should have these periodic studies performed, um, remove sediment if you need to. Maybe pavement consultants, they can come out and do core samples, or even an arborist. If you're a large HUA with a bunch of mature trees, um, you could be faced with a really large cost to remove dead trees, replace trees. It's a good idea to have an arborist come out periodically to assess the condition of your trees. That really is beyond the limits of a reserve study. Um, Michelle, another question on this slide uh, from an attendee is, can, can the costs of these types of specialists be funded through your association's reserve account? So it is that sort of um, 
a topic that reserve specialists are talking about. Um, in light of the Surfside tragedy, there's been a lot of talk around reserve studies and us as an industry, honestly, are meeting regularly to talk about these sort of things. And it is a little divided. Um, I would say the reserve specialist as a whole, the community doesn't agree on that. Um, reserve advisors, our standpoint is these can be very expensive and something that you can include in the reserve study if you want to um, include these periodics. So you would tell us which ones you're going to include and it would be something that we would periodically include in the study as a reserve expense. Great, thank you. So why are professional services overlooked? Uh, unfortunately, many boards feel their duty is to not spend money rather than to spend it prudently. The goal really should be to spend money well, not limit spending. Some boards unfortunately expect the manager to know all the answers. Uh, the manager's job really is to manage. You need to allow them to do so uh, properly by hiring, allow them to hire these experts and bring them in when needed. A manager can't be expected to know everything about everything. Next slide, please. So why are professional consultants necessary? Where they're gonna help detect those hidden or unseen conditions. When they do that, they're gonna be able to identify any critical issue, safety hazards, or other potential failures. They're gonna help you understand your specific budget needs for maintenance. And then they're also gonna validate best maintenance practices. So number three, we wanna make sure that we're accounting for these expenses in the budget. So historically, we're thought to think of the budget in kind of two categories, right? There's operation and maintenance, and then there's replacement reserves. We really should be thinking of three distinct budget categories. There's the operating expenses, then a separate category for maintenance expenses, and then lastly, replacement reserves. Each really has its own purpose. I wanted to cover some examples since we're breaking them out to three sections. What are examples of each? Well, true operation type expenses might be things like insurance premiums, utilities, or taxes. Then there's management expenses, so professional management contracts, or if you employ staff covering their payroll. And then professional consultant expenses. So it is pretty typical for association to have uh, an attorney or lead, kind of legal fee line item to uh, make sure that they are funding for any issues that might come up. Uh, they might have a line item for an accountant for an annual audit. But it is a good idea um, to also have and include a reserve specialist for a reserve study and then some of the other things we mentioned. So an arborist uh, for your evaluation of your trees or possibly a structural evaluation of your building or a pipe study or a pond specialist if you have a bunch of ponds. So ideally these would be included in the operations budget. But as I mentioned um, in regards to that question, it is something that absolutely can be included in the reserve study, especially if it's a pretty expensive study. So what are some maintenance budget examples? So these are really going to be for the same components that are in the reserve budget as well, right? It, it, they're both geared with maintaining your common elements. So you are going to want to proactively maintain these elements. Uh, you're going to want to have service contracts, say, for example, on maybe your pool equipment or your HVAC systems or your elevators. You're probably going to have some annual service contracts, so pool maintenance, maybe a landscaping maintenance contract. And then you're going to want to have some money for building services equipment, right? So routine kind of repairs of, say, pumps, for example, or any minor equipment. And lastly, we're going to have that replacement reserve budget. So again, it's the same components, all those common elements, but now we're looking at the replacement and major repair for those elements, right? So of the eventual replacement of the HVAC system or the modernization of the elevator. Uh, a general rule of thumb that I like to use uh, and that we use here is kind of 1% of the operating budget as the reserve cutoff. So say, for example, your operating budget is $200,000. We would use a typical cutoff of, say, $2,000, meaning anything below $2,000, probably general maintenance and operating, and anything above would be a reserve component. 
assuming it's not something that you're doing annually, right? And the reason for that is you really don't wanna bog your reserve study down with a lot of these really small expenses that makes it a really difficult um, report to digest and to read, right? You want it to be these big ticket items and fund some of the, some of the smaller projects through that maintenance budget. So in conclusion, um, it's important to remember that some hidden conditions aren't really hidden, right? They just haven't been identified. Don't expect your reserve study to be a substitute for these periodic in-depth assessments. You really should be budgeting for consultants to provide those periodic in-depth studies to enhance your reserve study. Make sure you're thinking in terms of three budgets, each with its own distinct purpose. And then lastly, make sure you're not cutting budget corners by expecting your manager or management company to fulfill the need for these regular inspections by professional consultants that truly specialize in these individual fields. Great. Thanks, Michelle. With that, we'll turn it over to Robert Travis. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you, uh, everybody, for attending our event today. Uh, this is a, a, a great way of basically promoting uh, the, the, the help that's available through CAI and the Foundation of Community Association Research, as this is all kind of a, uh, an offshoot of the, um, of the work done by the Foundation on the Breaking Point study. Uh, a little bit about my background, not too much. I retired uh, after uh, working for a company called Community Association Underwriters for 24 years. And I was the vice president of marketing and sales for them. I retired in March of 2019 and then started my own little consulting firm, more so because I just wanted to keep my finger in the mix and, uh, and keep myself somewhat knowledgeable and kind of turn my old work into my new hobby, so to speak. Um, so <clears throat> my background is I've, since 1986, have exclusively insured and done risk management work with community associations across the country. And, uh, and I'm more than happy to be part of this presentation today. Matt, if you could move to the next slide. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to do, and as you heard earlier in the, in the initial introduction, is that uh, Joel was on the actual, what we call the, the think tank, uh, which is the group of individuals that kind of research situations and say, you know, this is an area where we need to do a study. And it was the think tank that brought the, uh, the, the aging infrastructure problem to the forefront with the, the foundation. And then Michelle and I are both members of the foundation board. Um, so when this idea was brought to us, um, it was referred to as the unsustainable, or some folks would rather say the unsustainable business model. And I'd like to kind of explain that because this is probably one of the biggest uh, talking points as to why the foundation decided to take this particular uh, subject on. Um, now I, I can't see if I'm on the screen or not. Am I on the screen, Matt? I just see you. Uh, you should see the Foundation for Community Association Research uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, but, is, but am I on? Am I on? My, my face like Michelle and, and Joel, because I just see you right now. Um, I, I see all four panelists. I'm not sure okay. if the attendees see you. Well, then I, I was going to hold something up to the screen here, but I'm not going to do that because I, I don't see myself. Um, but in, in, I just sent one message. They could see you. Okay, good. So <laughs> I'm going to put up, this is the study, the breaking point study. I'm going to prove here that Joel did not made up, make up the statistics right here in the study. 70% uh, of survey respondents indicated that maintaining property values was most important. So 70% of the respondents to the survey done by the foundation said that preserving resale values was most important. So there's pressure number one. And Joel talked about this very nicely. Then you have pressure number two, and that is, but keep the dues in line. And this is the, the dual pressure. Uh, and then you throw on top of that, that we have volunteer board of directors that we put in charge of this community association where the primary focus is to preserve resale values, even improve resale values. But 
don't let the do's get out of hand. And these become a, a real conflicting scenario um, for the, the, these volunteer boards to deal with. And then, you, and then you gotta say, we have volunteer boards running multi-million dollar companies, multi-million dollar corporations, and they all have various backgrounds. And, and probably maybe one or two of them have a construction background, but most of them have backgrounds that are out of the area. So because of this constant pressure to keep dues under control, yet preserve resale values, um, and putting this in the hand of a bunch of volunteers uh, who are feeling this pressure, uh, this is why it was deemed to be an unsustainable business model and something we, should, we, needed to, we needed to do something to help these boards out. And so that's the main reason why this, this breaking point study was done. We identified the fact that there was long-term infrastructure deterioration going on. Uh, we were hearing the stories day in and day out. And once again, as Joel said, this report, the, 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 the impetus of this report started three years ago. So this is way before uh, Champlain South, Tower South. And uh, we, were, we were talking about this for a full year and a half in, in programs like we're doing today uh, before Champlain South, Tower South happened. Uh, we, just, we, we determined that the community associations are ill-equipped to deal with the hidden damage, or as Michelle likes to say, the damage that we can't see. Uh, and that if we don't resolve the problem, if we don't maintain this problem, if we don't take, take care of this problem on an, on an ongoing basis, we then ultimately have to take care of the problem when it becomes a critical potential disaster and that then becomes unplanned special assessments, which everybody loves. I mean, I know when I teach classes uh, for community association insurance, uh, both basic and uh, advanced classes with board members and with community managers, um, you know, you, you would think I need to get my mouth washed out with soap whenever I mention the word special assessments. Uh, so, you know, no one likes special assessments. And bank loans sound great until we realize we have to pay the loan back. So, <clears throat> you know, if we can avoid these special assessments, if we can avoid having to take out bank loans and maybe allow our lending power to help us maybe with something else and not deal with these, uh, these deteriorating infrastructure problems, uh, that would be best. Next slide. All right. What did the breaking point study discover? Uh, first of all, uh, board management guidelines, uh, the, they rarely discuss investigations beyond the reserve studies. This is the investigations being done what Michelle referred to as the professional consultants. So rarely do we go beyond the reserve study. And, and unfortunately, too typically what happens is that, yay, we're the board. We got the reserve study done. Check. Put it aside. Uh, and 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 let's let's talk about possibly whether we want to fund it or not. Um, number one, why do a reserve study if you're not going to fund it? Number one, uh, you know it's 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 very very important when you realize that you have these ongoing uh, responsibilities of, of repair, replacing the roof in 30 years, replacing the siding in 25 years, replacing the decking in 15 years. Um, it, it makes no sense to me to take your reserve study and say, well, that's good, I'm glad we have it. Maybe we'll need to reference this sometime in the future, but we're not gonna fund it. So number one thing here is a funding your reserves and then moving on off the reserve, beyond the reserve and talking to your professional consultants. And I like the, I like the comparison that both Michelle and Joel made about, you know, buildings are like people. So I kind of wrote down a few things as, as Joel and Michelle were talking. I'm a 65 year old man, okay? So I go to a general practitioner. That's my reserve specialist, okay? Uh, because of my age and because of the deterioration my body's going to, my general practitioner sends me to a dermatologist because I spent my entire youth playing baseball and I have uh, no skin problems to date, but I have you know, all sorts of evidence that I've been in the sun a lot in my lifetime. So I go see a dermatologist on a regular basis. I see an eye specialist because believe it or not, I had cataracts in both eyes by the age of 40. Why? Because I spent all those years in the sun playing baseball. So now I see an eye specialist on a regular basis. Uh, 
I, I, I go to a gastroenterologist because I, I have the colonoscopy done now at my age, I'm getting it done every five years. So I go see him and I have a blood disorder where I see an oncologist in regards to the blood disorder. So I'm seeing four specialists and I, that, that's just the ones I can remember. I'm sure I'm seeing more, but if a 65 year old man is doing all of that, we should then be looking at our buildings the same way, not just dealing on the reserve specialist, the general practitioner, but getting some other specialists then because we all have these systems throughout our building. We all have these walls throughout our building and there are things behind these walls that we need to know more about. Uh, second thing, reserve study protocols do not include invas intrusive or invasive investigations. Uh, I think Michelle kind of covered that quite well. I don't need to go into that anymore. Um, large numbers of survey respondents reported finding damage that had not been previously reported. Uh, Joel kind of uh, expanded on that. And this is, a, you know, this is a surprise that you don't want to have. Uh, you don't want to find out that, uh, you know, that uh, the, the rebar that is, that is, is within your poured concrete throughout your building, uh, you don't want to find out it's, deter it's deteriorating and causing a problem when all of a sudden your, uh, your, your concrete's falling off the building. It would be nice to know if we can find out about that uh, beforehand. Like Michelle showed you the photos and the example of the, the patio decking there, you know, getting down there and seeing, you know, on a regular basis, is the membrane deteriorating? Because it's going to be a whole lot cheaper to, to, to take care of the membrane when it starts to deteriorate than have to dig down and replace all the concrete that's underneath the, the, the membrane as well. Uh, and this was, this, this breaking point was the first nationwide study to investigate all these hidden or non-discovered damages in community association buildings. And uh, I know I see one of the questions about, um, uh, about uh, how to get a, a, your hands on a copy of the report. Uh, we'll cover that at the end of the presentation here. Next slide. All right, who has the obligation to pay for the deferred maintenance and hidden damage? Uh, there's a, a couple slides later that I'm going to get to because I'm starting to run out of time here, and I know your 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 time is important, so I'm going to try and get done here at least uh, on time. So we'll hit that later on. The impact of litigation versus board of directors. Joel talked about this. These are these are boards getting sued because they fail to do the things to prevent uh, the, the the catastrophic cost of dealing with an infrastructure problem when you discover it too late and when it becomes basically a, a bit of a, cat, a catastrophe or a bit of a disaster. And uh, all of a sudden, if you're living in a building where you're, you're not too sure that the, the cement uh, roof above your head is gonna hold up because it's been deteriorating, uh, people get emotional about that. And, uh, and often the, the result is a suit against the board and against the, the association for failure to, to properly maintain these things. Uh, there's an area, if you have to jump in and repair things when you didn't expect to repair, I have to do special assessments. There's a huge impact on your budgets and financial statements. Location safety, about three months ago, I went out and did an inspection at a community association that literally had to have the planking. If you're familiar with the planking, like if you go to New York City or any major city and there's construction going on up on a high rise and they put that, that plywood planking above you so you can walk on the sidewalk so if something falls, you don't get hit in the head. Uh, well, this association had planking like that uh, on all its walkways because it had all exterior walkways that led to the units and they had chunks of concrete falling off and falling on their walkway. Uh, that's a problem in regards to location safety. That then relates to resale values. Uh, pretty hard to sell a, a unit in a condominium association when there is obvious problems of the concrete falling or, or the, the, the roof being problematic and leaking, uh, whether it's an internal plumbing system or heating system that's failing and needs to be replaced, none of that helps resale values. And some of this, surprisingly little of it, but some of this does eventually become potential insurance claims. Next slide. Okay. Um, the big thing about that slide is resolving uh, what would be uninsured losses. We want to get ahead of this uh, problem and these, these regular inspections that go beyond reserve studies are going to allow us to do that. So that's the, the kind of the key thing from that slide is 
we're doing this so we resolve what could be large uninsured losses by using proper maintenance and using our maintenance budget to, to get a handle on that. Next slide. Um, the answer to that question earlier uh, is that certainly it is the associations, the board directors and the management that have the responsibility of maintaining common elements from deterioration, loss of value and owner and public safety. Owner and public safety, which is part of your risk management. So basically the study did conclude that uh, there's no way around this. Uh, board and management uh, are, are solely responsible for making sure that this aging infrastructure is dealt with. Next slide. Um, first party property, there's lots of limitations and exclusions. Number one, you know, a, a lot of these internal systems, especially those that deal with water and deal with steam, create mold if they're, if they're not operating correctly. And, uh, and there aren't too many policies out there right now that are providing coverage for damage to property because of mold. Uh, there's mechanical breakdown. Uh, aging machinery, uh, machinery getting exposed to elements that it shouldn't be exposed to, and it breaks down unless you have specialized mechanical breakdown coverage, you're not going to have any coverage for that. Uh, water intrusion from outside the building skin, uh, the damage done by that water intrusion is typically uh, not covered um, uh, by, the, uh, by the association's policy. There probably would be some coverage if the roof leaks and we're damaging the property of others like our unit owners. But as far as the, the association's own infrastructure itself, that damage is not gonna be covered. Water damage, internal piping and systems, the, the example I like to make that everybody has, has, has lived through in their, in their careers here, either when a hot water heater bursts or when pipes burst, either because they're aged and they, they let go, or because they're frozen pipes. Remember how insurance works on that. We pay for all the damage done by all the water escaping from that hot water heater. We pay for all that damage done by all the water escaping from the pipes, but we're not gonna pay to replace the pipes. And so just think of now, instead of thinking of a hot water heater, think of our building, think of our structure, think of our infrastructure, and realize that if there's some kind of water damage going on inside these buildings and structures, the, 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 the cause of the damage uh, is, is the, the internal piping and the systems, if they have to be replaced, that's not gonna be covered by insurance. Next slide. Third party insurance coverage. Uh, you know, we've talked about DNL a little bit. I'm not gonna kind of expound on that, uh, but certainly thinking about the community associations that put up the, the planking to protect people from getting hit in the head with falling concrete, uh, certainly that becomes a, a general liability concern. Uh, that's a bodily injury concern. Uh, if things are happening with our roof and our roof is leaking and we're damaging the property of our unit owners, that becomes a property damage problem. Wrongful acts relates to directors and officers liability. And the other thing I'd like to add on to this is if we're a large enough community association where we have workers, uh, are our workers exposed to this kind of uh, hazardous uh, working conditions. And if we, uh, if we get injuries to our workers, we then have an impact on our workers' compensation. Uh, next slide. All right. Uh, Bob, before we go to the next slide, we want to launch our, our final poll here real quick. Perfect. Uh, so let's make sure that, that let's make sure that this is going to work for everybody. Uh, this presentation was based off of a study called Breaking Point, Examining Aging Infrastructure and Community Associations. What organization developed and distributed this study? All right, a lot of answers coming in here. 75% uh, of you are correct. It is the Foundation for Community Association Research. With that, Bob, I'll go ahead and toggle over here to the to your final slide. Okay, so there's the there's a copy of what Breaking Point looks like. Uh, there's the foundation website. Uh, I noticed here in the chat that Michelle's telling folks that she's going to get uh, links to get a copy of the Breaking Point uh, report as well. You can also go onto the foundation website. 
Uh, and uh, it's, I, I, I have to just, you know, and it, it feels funny because I'm a member of it, but I just got to give the foundation all sorts of credit uh, for tackling this, uh, this, this aging infrastructure problem with a rather exhaustive study. Uh, sessions like the one that we're doing today uh, have spontaneously broke out all across the country, uh, even before Champlain Tower South, but certainly since Champlain Tower South. Everybody that lives in an older building, everybody that lives on, on, on a seashore type exposure, everybody that lives in anything that's considered mid-rise and high-rise is now very, very uh, interested in their infrastructure and whether they're having an aging infrastructure problem. So I, I got to give the foundation all sorts of credit for, uh, for, for addressing the problem. Uh, I, I'd like to thank Michelle for, uh, and Matt for hosting this, this program today. Joel's been a part of this from the very beginning because he was in the think tank that came up with the idea and brought it to the foundation. So, uh, and lastly, I'd like to thank everybody who attended this. Uh, I, I personally don't think the foundation has ever tackled a more important issue than aging infrastructure for community associations. And I hope we're helping present some kind of resolve and solution to the problem for people in the future that uh, either have to deal with this or prevent this from happening to them. That's all I got, Matt. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes here for some um, Q and A. Um, we did answer quite a few questions. It looks like through the the chat function, but there were a couple here that I wanted to touch on briefly. Uh, first is how do we get how do we get a copy of the materials from today's presentation? We will be sending an email out to all that attended. Um, there will be a recording of today's webinar. Uh, we can also include a link to the breaking point report as well as the the PowerPoint handout. There will also be a couple of additional. Uh, pieces of content that, that speak to aging infrastructure. There was another question, I don't know, Michelle, if you want, if this is best for you or Joel, um, uh, how, how frequently should an association hire different types of specialists? I know this is a general question. There's a lot of different types of specialists. Um, maybe the association is experiencing issues, maybe it's not, but when should they start looking at hiring different types of specialists and what might dictate the frequency of, of um, contracting with that type of specialist? Yeah, that's really going to vary based on the specific component, and your reserve specialist will be able to kind of speak to that. Um, just using a facade as an example, if you're, um, you have a, a masonry facade, right? If it's a newer property, probably every eight to 12 years is what we say is, is fine. Um, but as the community ages, now if you're, you know, a 1920s building, uh, you're going to want to start ramping up and doing those inspections more frequently. So it really is kind of site Dependent, condition dependent, and age um, will definitely play a factor. You really should be able to rely on your reserve study provider. Um, you know, if, if you think you need to start consulting with specialists for any any type of property component, reach out to your reserve study provider. Uh, they you know they're that uh, they're a valuable asset for you and your association. Uh, they can talk talk to you about what issues you might be experiencing and whether it it warrants reaching out to a specialist. There are a couple of questions in here specific to individual properties and their reserve studies. So um, we do have all of the questions. Um, questions of that nature, we'll go ahead and make sure that we reach out to you directly to, to um, answer any questions there. Yeah, one question that I think was uh, maybe applicable to, to more people is uh, how are reserve studies treated regarding insurance premiums? As an HOA, are we obligated to share the results of a reserve study with the insurance company slash as part of a quote? Are we obligated to share the reserve study with mortgage providers? Um, that might be a better question for the other gentleman on the other line. I could say that I have heard that um, an insurance uh, professional did tell me that they do like to review a reserve study. They will always request it to help understand their risk. And if this association is pretty deteriorated, they have a lot of upcoming projects and no funds available, it's a higher risk, right? Um, so that is something they consider. As far as the mortgage providers, FHA for uh, FHA approval for condominiums, they do require reserve study. They want to see that condominiums are funding reserves at the recommended level. But I'll kind of kick over to the other gentleman on the call. Well, I'll I'll address the the, the, the underwriting, and I'll, I'll I'll ask Joel to kind of jump in when I'm done. But in the past, there have been occasional requests by certain carriers to, to get a copy of a reserve study. Uh, but in my opinion, underwriters have never, until recently, really grasped the importance of, of having a reserve study to evaluate a risk. 
Uh, what is going to happen now, and what has already happened now, is that after Champlain Tower South, uh, all of a sudden I get all sorts of questions from underwriters that I've worked in the past is, hey, Bob, do you know the, about these things called reserve studies? And, and, and why, why would we want to be, why is this important to us as, as underwriters? And uh, you know, my, my, my response to them is, yeah, I think it's something you should have been asking for years now, and I explain why. So I do think, I do think that it's going to be requested. It's not something you have to divulge over to the insurance company until they ask. But I do believe that you're going to see, just like insurance companies are now asking for copies of your community association documents and asking for a copy of the budget and the financials, I think as time goes on, requesting for reserve copies of reserve studies and asking if they're funded are going to be kind of uh, in the same lexicon as those other items. What do you think, Joel? Oh, I, I definitely agree. Um, I think uh, it's a prophetic question because I think if you keep your ears open over the next year, um, a lot of your uh, insurance professionals will be asking you that because uh, as Bob said, you know, um, carriers have found God and are now requesting these. Uh, I have always told in insurance professionals, you got, I mean, it's the best blueprint of an association to be able to properly provide um, what you, what the association needs. And you have to also keep in mind that insurance underwriters are somewhat uh, skeptical. So if they ask for it and you don't want to give it to them, you know, it creates a perception of, you know, of why don't you want to give it to us? And, but I think it's going to be, they're going to be asking more questions. And, uh, and so I think I would be prepared. Good. Thank you both. Uh, one other question, Michelle, uh, geared towards you is uh, there was a question about um, the frequency for reserve study updates. And I know um, there's a little bit of chat in there about general, you know, spe generally speaking, three to five years is the industry average. Do you want to touch base briefly on what types of things might dictate the need for an update when, when associations should consider updating? Sure, yeah. I mean, it all goes back to that uh, body analogy, right? As we age, we're probably going to need to increase the frequency, right? Three to five is a kind of general rule of thumb. Um, but as you age, you probably, the property ages, you probably want to get closer to that three than that five-year cycle, which might be fine for a, a brand new community, right? Or if you've substantially deviated from your reserve study, it's time to update it to get back on track. So if you decided to add a pool or completely change and modernize your clubhouse, the reserve study no longer capture or doesn't capture that information, right? So you want to make sure that these new components are added in um, and that your funding plan is kind of adjusted as soon as possible. Because the longer you wait, um, you're going to have to make up for that lost time. Good, thank you. Uh, here's a general question. I'm not sure who might be best to answer this. Um, it just came in here. If we could elaborate on the role of the superintendent um, or that individual that's responsible for maintenance in a high-rise building um, and being able to discover, observe, monitor, and report on a proactive basis the problems discussed in today's webinar. Yeah, that, I mean, that's really going to be site-specific. There are some associations and buildings that really um, prefer to do that in-house and they hire a very experienced person that is likely capable of some of that preventative maintenance for some mechanical equipment. Um, but more often than not, they are doing kind of routine, real routine maintenance, um, but anything that's more involved, say uh, repairs to a pump or something like that, you might need to seek outside help. So that's really going to vary um, on your specific needs, but more often than not, you're probably still going to need to bring in a specialist in those various components. A typical building engineer wouldn't be able to repair an elevator, for example. Very good. Thank you. That, that is all that we have for today. As I mentioned, there were some, uh, some additional questions. We'll make sure that we review those and get, uh, we'll reach out, uh, whether it's uh, Robert, Michelle, or Joel, uh, we'll reach out to you directly to uh, make sure that we address your, your questions that you have. We thank you all for your time, uh, and you can expect to receive an email by uh, late this afternoon with uh, the content from today's presentation. Thank you, and have a great day.